Weather today in the greater Cincinnati area. And I remember when cars only had AM radios. <laughs> I wouldn't kid you about that. Hey, 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 stop tuning the station. I'm trying to tell you something here. Hey, don't touch that dial. I'm just... Baby, if you've ever wondered, wondered whatever became of me. I'm living on the air in Cincinnati. Do you remember the 21st of September? Well, three days before that, in 1978, we witnessed the launch of a brand new radio station on CBS TV. When I first came to Cincinnati, I had gotten kind of tired packing and unpacking town to town up and down the dial. <laughs> so let's just say I knew I was here to stay. And I never, ever wanted to. WKRP in Cincinnati became an instant fan favorite as well as one to those in the music and radio industries. As anticipated and welcomed as this was, not everyone was pleased. We seem to be experiencing some technical difficulties here in the studio. Please stay tuned. We'll be back as soon as we get it fixed, okay? All right, you two up against the wall. <laughs> I don't know what you want here, but I think you should know that I've killed a lot of old people in my time. <laughs> I'm not above doing it again. But if you're like me, over four decades later, you can still enjoy the hilarity and antics of the DJs and staff members. But what happened to the cast after the original WKRP shut down in 1982? If you or someone you know has been in the business, you know radio gigs can be fleeting. Some are lucky enough to spend many years at one station, but for most, the tenure of one gig to the other can become blurry. Where'd you go from there? Denver, Boise, Fargo, it's all a blur to me. <laughs> <laughs> tell you this though, I never thought I'd end up at WKRP in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Cincinnati? Yes. <laughs> This is rock bar. WKRP has been a beacon to its fans all these years, so I thought it would be interesting to look at the careers of those players after the iconic show ended. Before we begin, here's a trivia question. What was Tim Reed's character's on-air radio name before he became Venus Flytrap? Stick around and I'll have the answer as we look at the post-radio careers of the cast from WKRP in Cincinnati. Gary Sandy was one of only two cast members to actually grow up in Ohio. As program director Andy Travis, he had his hands full trying to improve the station and manage the rambunctious personnel. Pearl, will you quit picking on Les? <laughs> During his time on the show, Gary was considered quite the hunk, and he was not about to argue that. <laughs> You're closer than the beefcake over there. <laughs> now wait just a minute. I hate to interrupt here. And don't. Okay. <laughs> My first memory of Gary Sandy was from an episode of Chips, but he really got his start on daytime soap operas, Another World, and As the World Turns. After KRP, Gary showed his range with a slew of dramatic roles that included Murder, She Wrote, L.A. Law, several TV movies, and a return to the soaps with the young and the restless. However, one of his first loves was the theater, where one of his many forays included a musical version of Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor, as well as a challenging one-man 1985 production, Billy Bishop Goes to War, in which he enacted 17 different roles. That's a lot of juggling. And speaking of that, Gary did have a thing going with Lenny Anderson for a while but more on that later. Lunny was the breakout star of the series. Although it's hard to imagine a Minneapolis native as anything other than a blonde, she was actually born with jet black hair and remained a brunette for the early part of her career. She was already on her second marriage in 1975 when she and her husband relocated to L.A. to pursue film and television work. 
By the way, you have seen her husband when he appeared as rival station WPIG's general manager, Callahan. This was in the episode Baseball, even though they were really playing softball. The thing I loved best about Jennifer was that Lonnie Anderson refused to have her portrayed as the stereotypical dumb blonde. She was smart, well-read, a bit of a gold digger, but witty, caring, and articulate, which made it even funnier in an episode where her character steps out of character to fool a consultant. Oh, Mr. Breezy. <laughs> We've been expecting you. Would you like to sit down? We have all kinds of chairs. There's one over there, and there's another one over there, and that... No, that's a clock. <laughs> After WKRP and two Emmy nominations, there was no shortage of work for Lonnie as she appeared in movies portraying tragic Hollywood legends Jane Mansfield and Thelma Todd. She also had a short-lived series with Linda Carter in 1984 called Partners in Crime. This tall brunette, born with a silver spoon in her mouth, was Private Eye Raymond Dashiell Caulfield's first wife. Wise Blonde and I have only two things in common. We were both married to the same man, and we both divorced him. We met for the first time at his funeral. Are you ready for this? He left us his mansion, mortgage to the hilt, and the Caulfield Detective Agency. And how do we manage? We call the cops a lot. Jennifer Marlowe with Wonder Woman. How could that miss? I mentioned Lonnie's marriage to Ross Bickle at the start of WKRP. Unfortunately, that fizzled in 1981, and she had a torrid affair with co-star Gary Sandy. That too fell apart as Gary felt left behind when Lonnie's star began to outshine his, and pretty much everyone else's. Lonnie stated at the time that she would never again date someone unless he was a bigger star than herself. So guess where that led her? I forget exactly how that ended up, but the mess did ultimately damage both their reputations. Lenny is currently married to her former flame, Bob Flick, who is an original member and co-founder of the group The Brothers Four. They met at a movie premiere when she was 17 years old and a model, and they've been married since 2008. Of course, the lady's favorite and the biggest stud muffin on the show was five-time Buckeye Newshawk Award winner and winner of the coveted Silver Sow Award, Les Nesman. Richard Sanders played the tough, hard-hitting newsman who pulled no punches in his dogged determination to bring you the facts. The following bulletin has just been received on the WKRP teletype. Monster lizard ravages East Coast. <laughs> Mayors in five New England cities have issued emergency requests for federal disaster relief as a result of the giant lizard that descended on the East Coast last night. <laughs> Officials say this lizard, the worst since 78, <laughs> has devastated transportation, disrupted communications, and left many hundreds homeless. A monster lizard? The wire service never lies. Les, the B is out on the printer. It's Monster Blizzard. <laughs> oh. Are you going to go back on the air? Well, I don't know if I should explain this or just go on. <laughs> just go on. Turning to the local scene. After WKRP, Sanders felt somewhat stifled and typecast by his Nesman character. The actor Richard Sanders was outgoing and sociable, but the character Les Nesman mostly lived alone. Lord knows what he did when he was by himself at night. I was wondering if you could pour something sticky all over me. Richard feared that his stint on KRP would lead to Nowheresville. And he was right. In 2000, he appeared in an independent film called Nowheresville, where he was a stalker named Wayne. He also reprised his Nesman News role in the new WKRP in Cincinnati and made several guest shots on Night Court, Married with Children, The Fugitive, Lover's Lane, and Men of Honor, just to name a few. 
If you've ever owned a Volkswagen Beetle and the seat covers came up missing, chances are it was made into a suit worn by Herb Tarlick. Frank Bonner played the slightly sleazy Sultan of Sales who rarely minced words, usually because he often didn't know their meaning. Adultery, admire... Let me see that. Obtuse. Adult-minded. Like Richard Sanders, Bonner reprised his most famous role in the new WKRP. I first saw Frank Bonner in a very weird 1970 film called Equinox, even though I didn't know who he was at the time. I do remember being somewhat disturbed by the film, though not enough to want to harm him in any way. Herb, I'm gonna punch you right in your polyester heart. After WKRP, Bonner made guest appearances in a number of shows, including Night Court, Evening Shade, and Murder, She Wrote, and was a regular on Saved by the Bell, The New Class, and Just the Ten of Us. Herb's TV wife, Lucille, played by Edie McClure, had an even more impressive post-KRP career. I've always loved the way Edie lights up a scene, but not everyone is swayed by her sunny disposition. Just a warning, the language in this clip is somewhat disturbing. Welcome to Marathon. May I help you? Yes. How may I help you? Mac a self approach. Slick, the gray matter back, lot performers down, not take TCB in, man. It's a motherfucker, but a limb into the bones. I really don't care for the way you're speaking to me. What it is, big mama? My mama didn't raise no dummies. I duck a rap. It's, it's a cutting thing. Say, 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 Fortunately, she has had a ton of roles to pad her resume, including Ferris Bueller's Day Off, CSI, NCIS, Desperate Housewives, and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. I think we can all agree that Edie has had a stellar career. The Bailey vs. Jennifer debates were a lot like the Ginger vs. Mary Ann debates, which ignored the fact that they all had very different styles and personalities. Like Mary Ann, Jan Smithers' character of Bailey Quarters was more of the down-home, approachable type that creator Hugh Wilson patterned after his own wife. Unlike most cast members, she only remained in acting for a short while after WKRP, appearing on shows such as The Love Boat, Hotel, and Mr. Nice Guy. She and Gary Sandy were the only two to not make an appearance in the new WKRP in Cincinnati. Karen Jan Smithers. Yes, her first name was Karen. Though with her sweet disposition, she doesn't seem like much of a Karen. Andy? You. Bailey struck me. What? Uh, she didn't strike me, but she, she bumped into me. Then, Threatened to set the whole city on fire by setting matches to my suit. <laughs> <laughs> you guys think it's funny, huh? Hey, Herb. What? Did you order those petitions? No. What do you think of that? Andy, do you have any matches? All right. <laughs> Where do you think you, you know, you get off being in charge of this whole thing anyway, huh? I mean, go ahead. Answer, answer, answer. Go ahead. Come on, sp sp speak, speak up, Venus. Come on, tell her. I mean, you know. In fact, you know, I think I'd like to move into one of these one of these new buildings. You know, all that steel and glass turns me off. All right, I'll order your petition. In 1986, she became stepmom to Josh Brolin when she married his dad, James Brolin. That union lasted nine years, and despite rumors, the marriage was not broken up by Barbara Streisand. Jan and Brolin had parted amicably a full five years before Streisand and Brolin got together. As of 2004, she was retired from acting and living in Nova Scotia, Canada, and later in Ojai, California.
The silky smooth nighttime DJ had an irresistible radio presence, which I personally aspired to be, even though I sounded more like Les Nesman. And now the shadows of evening wrap their silken arms around the troubles of the day, my children. This is Venus, all alone up here in the night, riding the chariots of fire and keeping watch over your dreams and maybe even a stray fantasy or two. Here is the magnificence of Mr. Ernie Watts. But he definitely was a magnet for his female listeners. Jennifer, I'm number one with women. Of course you are. Wow! Look what I'm doing with teenage boys! <laughs> this despite having an on-air name that most would associate with the fairer sex. But what was it with his name? This desk is the nerve center, Mr. Claptrap. Tim Reed also had no shortage of work after WKRP. He was almost immediately cast as the no-nonsense police lieutenant Downtown Brown on Simon & Simon, and he also appeared for two seasons in another Hugh Wilson production, Frank's Place, and of course as William Barnett on That 70s Show. Tim and his wife Daphne, who appeared on two episodes of WKRP, formed their own production company, New Millennium Studios, keeping them both busy in front of and behind the camera. Daphne also co-starred with Tim on Frank's Place, which was set in New Orleans. And if you recall, the Venus Flytrap character was a school teacher named Gordon Sims and part-time DJ in the Big Easy. Our trivia question was, what was his on-air name before becoming Venus Flytrap? Gordon Sims and the Sounds of the Night. Hold it. I don't use my real name. That's right, of course. Nobody does. You shouldn't. Uh, what, what, what was the name you used in, in New Orleans? The Duke of Funk. <laughs> the Duke of Funk. By the way, the Duke, or rather Venus, that is Tim, had met his second wife, Daphne Reed, while filming a Sears commercial back in 1972. They didn't hook up again until many years later in 1979. They've been married since 1982. If any cast member was most like his character, it had to be Howard Hessman, who was Dr. Johnny Fever. Hessman had been a leading counterculture figure since the late 1960s when he was a member of the improv group The Committee. He was a close friend and sometime lover of Janis Joplin in the late 60s, and he was also arrested for selling an ounce of marijuana in San Francisco in 1966. One has to wonder if this added to his later paranoia as he confronts one of the most notorious phone cops of the 1960s. Now, as a citizen, you have the right to demonstrate, but you have no right to break the law and interfere with the rights of others in so doing, and that includes the president. Break whose law? The establishments. Now, property rights are all they're concerned about, not human rights. And the president. Now, if we don't demonstrate, how do you suggest we reach him? Interestingly, during the committee's appearance on the Dick Cavett Show in 1969, Howard called one of his cast members fellow baby. <laughs> hey there, fellow baby. Do the bus to few gardens down here. <laughs> My sister beauty shop to have some black eyed greens and hog collar. No, 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 man. If you run that down on the brothers, we're going to have a long, hot summer all year round. <laughs> Nearly 10 years later, that would become part of his banter on WKRP. This was well suited for George Howard Hesman, who, like the show's creator, had worked as a DJ previously, even though he originally auditioned for the role of Herb Tarlick. Dr. Fever suited him better as I don't think he could have pulled off wearing those suits. After the cancellation of WKRP, he seamlessly went on to star as the husband of Ann Romano in One Day at a Time. After that series was canceled, he also starred in more cult classics such as This Is Spinal Tap, Dr. Detroit, Police Academy, Their First Assignment, and Flight of the Navigator. And like Tim Reed, he also had a recurring role on That 70s Show. He also had another part in a hit television series as a teacher in the high school sitcom Head of the Class as Mr. Moore. Hesseman left the show in 1990 and has done a steady stream of television guest roles since. Mama, 
If you remember the WKRP pilot, you would no doubt notice that the station owner, Mama Lillian Carlson, was quite different than in subsequent episodes. Not in disposition, but physically. Academy Award nominee Sylvia Sidney played Mama Carlson in just that one pilot episode, but creator Hugh Wilson said Sidney was not pleasant to work with and didn't get along with the cast or producer. And worse yet, she thought the show was ridiculous. She did go on to several other roles after KRP, including The Love Boat, Dear John, Mars Attacks, and Beetlejuice before her passing in 1999. When Carol Bruce took over the role and the station, she had to reshoot many of the scenes Miss Sidney had done earlier to use in flashbacks. She also appeared in several episodes of the new WKRP, as well as many others such as Different Strokes, Too Close for Comfort, and Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Mama Carlson may have appeared to be a heartless crone only interested in profits and dominance, but she was really a lonely woman in need of affection. your mind yes ma'am uh, yes i i think i have lost my mind uh, just just for a second there though but uh, i think i'm okay now well, if you're going to grab me do it nicely in the back seat of my robe <laughs> carol bruce died in 2007 but when she was on wkrp both she and sylvia sydney had an important common trait that's a mean little mama <laughs> you bet I mentioned Gary Sandy was one of the cast members actually from Ohio. Gordon Jump was the other. In fact, Jump had worked as a disc jockey for a radio station in Dayton. With all the responsibilities on his shoulders and all the managerial worries in his head, how would you describe the big guy? I'm uh, sorry I doubted you. Carlson's a real loony tune. <laughs> We all love the big guy anyway, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the veteran actor who had been in dozens of TV productions since the mid-60s remained just as proficient after WKRP ended. Gordon Jump appeared in episodes of Growing Pains, Seinfeld, Baywatch, and just like Herb and Les continued his role as Arthur Carlson on the new WKRP in Cincinnati. Before KRP, Jump had also worked with Howard Hessman on Soap, and he teamed up with fellow alum Edie McClure on an episode of Married with Children. I've been married five times myself. And I got a boyfriend. And in a mood that showed his fearlessness as an actor, he took on the thankless and potentially career-damaging role of a pedophile on a memorable episode of Different Strokes. Not only did this not harm his career or reputation, but he was once approached by a woman in a crowd who asked to give him a hug. She told him that his performance gave her the courage to talk to others about abuse she had suffered as a child. The burly actor was also closely identified for his role as the Maytag repairman. Oh, it's so lonely. No one to talk to, no calls, nothing. I'm just not needed. What is it exactly you do again? I'm the Maytag repairman. Oh. At Maytag, all our washers and dryers are still built to last longer and need fewer repairs. So, can you help me? I'm a doctor, not a miracle worker. Maytag. The dependability people. Of course, you also recognize the guy doing the voiceover none other than the one-time Herman Munster, Fred Gwynn. Let's face it, these days, network TV has become incredibly dull. Fortunately, there is something you could do about it. TV, be more funny! Ah. Ooh, you could pound that TV all night, but as far as the quality of the current crop of network programs today, Les Nesman described it best. Oh my God, they're talking! <laughs> Like 
So until next time, don't touch that dial. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the share button, especially if your friends, like you, have great taste. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel, that way you'll be notified whenever I add new content. And feel free to leave a comment or two. 